There might be a few stops and starts tonight. Aretha Franklin is iconic. She's known as the Queen of Soul, and for so many good reasons. Aretha Franklin was a diva. Respect is always special to do in concert. When Aretha Franklin sang respect, she said respect for all of us. Aretha became wealthy very quickly. Hit after hit meant higher and higher performance fees, tens of thousands of dollars. Later in Aretha's career, she had a problem with business managers and was very much trying to do her own thing and keep her money close. She would demand cash up front, usually $25,000, and she would stuff it in a purse. I love you so much. Thank you so much for coming out. You're so wonderful. It was thought by many people that Aretha Franklin didn't even have a will. And then all of a sudden, not only did they find one will, but they found three wills. This created a huge problem for the children and created all kinds of conflict. This fight, it's ugly. It's ongoing, and it's going on between four brothers. The family could go in and resolve this conflict themselves. But of course, when we have big money, that doesn't happen, and the family is fighting. When a celebrity checks out, there's no shortage of people ready to cash in. There's a ton of money to be made on the backs of dead celebrities. And with millions of dollars at stake, the battles over the estates of the rich and famous can lead to some serious drama. This is the story of how the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, earned her title and her fortune, and how the surprise discovery of multiple wills would transform an amicable estate proceeding into an all-out war with brother pitted against brother for control. When Aretha Franklin dies at the age of 76 in 2018, she reportedly leaves behind an estate of somewhere between 17 and as much as $80 million. At the time of her death, Aretha's tangible assets include 25 gold records and 18 Grammy Awards, her iconic red-colored Young Chang Grand Piano, records and CDs, multiple homes in Michigan estimated to be worth over $2 million, Aretha's famous fur coat collection of at least 25 coats, stoles, and fur-trimmed capes estimated at $1 million. Her famous hat collection, at least $1 million in uncashed royalty checks, a $1.6 million bank account, and a debt to the IRS estimated between $6.3 and $8 million. Aretha Franklin's Detroit funeral was an elaborate, star-studded affair. Aretha was not just music royalty, she was Detroit royalty. More than 100 pink Cadillacs lined up to join the funeral procession in tribute to Franklin's hit, Freeway of Love, that became an anthem in the Motor City. Aretha Franklin's funeral was an extravagant affair, just as it should have been, befitting the Queen of Soul. When she died, no one can find a last will and testament. How is it possible that the Queen of Soul, who earned millions of dollars during her career, did not have a will? Her main beneficiaries are her four sons, Clarence, Edward, Ted, and Calf. Her niece, Sabrina Owens, is assigned as her estate executor. Under Michigan state law, if there's no will, then the money is divided evenly among the children. So that's the process that they started after she died. But everyone would get a massive shock when nearly eight months later, Sabrina Owens discovers not one, not two, but three handwritten wills hidden in various parts of Aretha's home. One was found in the cushions of a couch, and two were found in a locked box, but these were not formal wills. They were like kind of notarized and kind of signed, and things were crossed out, and things weren't clear. And so this created a whole legal quagmire the bickering and family drama would play out in probate court in the months to come. The ultimate question was, which of Aretha's family members would ultimately be put in charge of Aretha Incorporated? It comes down to money, power, who's gonna make the decisions on how this brand's gonna be managed in the future. 
But how did Aretha earn her title as the Queen of Soul and her fortune, which by some accounts could have been even higher given her talent and popularity? Born March 25, 1942, Aretha Louise Franklin grows up in Detroit City, and her life is shaped by gospel music. Her father, C.L. Franklin, is a minister and civil rights activist. Known as the man with the million-dollar voice, the recordings of his sermons are big sellers. Her father was a very well-known minister in Detroit. His sermons were considered captivating, full of gospel music, and that's where Aretha Franklin gets her start, singing in her father's church. I was about 10, and they put a small box in front of the uh, pulpit so I could be seen over the pulpit, and that's where I would stand and sing. As a child, Aretha already has a deep well of emotion to draw on for her music. Her parents separate when she is six, and at 10 years old, her beloved mother Barbara dies of a sudden heart attack, leaving Aretha and her siblings behind. Aretha loses her mom at a really young age, and that was so traumatic, she stopped speaking for several years. She had lived a life. She had really lived a life and she put all of that into her music. By the time she's 12, Aretha is regularly performing in her father's traveling gospel tours across America and getting paid. So what she likes to do in her spare time is go to the roller rink, and she's earning this $15 a week and spending it on expensive skates. It's $30 a wheel. Now you do the math. Those were expensive skates. But 12-year-old Aretha isn't a regular preteen. What most people don't know about Aretha is that she was a child mother. She had a child at 12 years old. Aretha has a son she names Clarence. And two years later, she's pregnant once more with her son, Edward. There is a lot of pressure in this very young life, but yet she knew she wanted to be a singer. And those around her knew that she had the skill to be this great singer. Her dad, C.L. Franklin, and he's recognized not just in the religious community, but also in the entertainment community. Superstars like Sam Cooke are coming through to visit their home, and they're all recognizing Aretha and the talent that she has. He really wanted to make her a star. Aretha is a working mom of 18, when in 1960, she signs her first official recording contract. Now, at the time, you would think that the obvious choice would be Motown Records, but it's not. She ends up signing a deal with Columbia. Now, the reason why? CL has a relationship there. Not long after, Aretha meets her first husband, Ted White, who, despite not being in the music business, becomes her manager. And her brother is not fond of this relationship. He thinks Ted is bad news. Between 1960 and 1965, Aretha puts out 10 albums for Columbia in diverse genres, show tunes, torch songs, blues, standards, novelties, pop, and quasi R&B. But chart-topping hits are elusive. Aretha releases a series of well-received singles on Columbia. Critics like them, but they didn't really set the world on fire. They didn't get a lot of radio airplay. Um, there wasn't a lot of attention paid by kids. So the A&R people at Columbia Records were kind of in control of what Aretha was going to sound like. She wasn't really in control at all. In 1964, Aretha's son, Ted White Jr., is born. At the time, Franklin is earning a very good living on the touring circuit, playing nightclubs and theaters around the country. It's the mid-1960s, and Aretha Franklin is making over $100,000 a year, but she's still not a star. And ultimately, Aretha attributes this to Columbia not promoting her properly. With her Columbia contract coming up for renewal, Aretha is convinced that she needs a new label. At that time, in the 60s, Something else was happening in the world. The civil rights movement was going on, and none of the songs that Aretha Franklin was singing really connected with that time, and it didn't really hit in the black community the way she really wanted to. Atlantic Records specializes in jazz, R&B, and soul, and producer Jerry Wexler has had his eye on Franklin for a while. He recognizes her as the sublime soul singer she is. So when she had an opportunity to leave Columbia and sign with Atlantic Records, she wanted to do the kinds of music that she was hearing in the streets. And she wanted to do the kind of music that would connect to her community. And by 1967, she enters the studio to record her first album for Atlantic. 
I Never Loved a Man the Way I Love You, will feature one song in particular that becomes Aretha's personal anthem and launches her into mega stardom. It's titled Respect. When Aretha Franklin sang Respect, she said respect for all of us. I think that's what it resonated so well through the civil rights movement, through the feminist movement, because even though she was talking about R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me, she was talking to all of us because we wanted respect as black people. We wanted respect as women. Originally written and recorded by Otis Redding, Aretha, along with her sisters Carolyn and Irma singing backup, gives the song a new flavor. Re, 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 everyone thinks that's referring to respect, the word respect. It's actually not. Her sisters added that little riff in, and it's referring to Aretha. We're gonna make sure that everyone knows this is an Aretha Franklin track. The single for respect surges to number one and becomes a cultural phenomenon. It did evolve to an anthem of a sort. When my sister and I were working on it, no. They, those were the days of laughing and uh, early 60s and Motown and Bobby Socks and Cokes and so on. Uh, no, I had no idea that it would become the anthem that it did. And to know how relevant it still is today, I mean, that woman, ah, she's transcended time, and what she stands for, it still hits home. The album, I Never Loved a Man the Way I Love You, would go to number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and R&B charts and becomes the first million-selling record of Aretha Franklin's career. The single for Respect would win two Grammy Awards for Best R&B Recording and Best Solo Female R&B Performance. When famed music producer, the man who actually coined the phrase rhythm and blues, Jerry Wexler, played Aretha's version of Respect, Otis Redding said, I just lost my song, and he wasn't happy with the popularity. But let's be honest, he was happy with the money coming from the popularity because he still was getting tons of the royalties from this song. Over the next year, Aretha makes four more albums for Atlanta in quick succession and has seven more top 10 pop hits, several that she writes herself, including Think and Dr. Feelgood. Everything that Aretha Franklin did, it came from the divine. Even when she was singing Respect, even when she was singing Dr. Feelgood, there was something divine in her assertion of her sexuality. By 1967, Aretha has not only been crowned the Queen of Soul by a DJ in Chicago, she's quadrupled her performance fees. She is in incredible demand as a live performer. She goes from making $750 a show to tens of thousands a show. Her booking agents can't keep up with the demand. Aretha is starting to make a lot of money, and she starts to spend it. She purchases a four-bedroom house in an exclusive Detroit neighborhood for $60,000. And she purchases the first of many mink coats. In June 1968, what should be a monumental career landmark leaves a bitter aftertaste. A pivotal moment in Aretha's life as a famous songstress was when she was chosen for the cover of Time magazine. However, when the article came out, Aretha was devastated. They made some very, very unflattering observations about Aretha, saying that she was chain-smoking and eating snacks in front of the television, implying that she was lazy. But most insulting to her was they implied that her husband, Ted White, had been abusive to her. I think there's a lot to be said about the media being predominantly white at that time and not understanding who Aretha was as a person. In truth, Aretha and Ted do have physical fights often fueled by alcohol. Aretha is terrified her career is ruined and never fully trusts the media again. Aretha Franklin was the queen, and you don't treat the queen like just any old body. You keep the queen's secrets. And so I think the Time Magazine cover and what they exposed about her really hurt her. By the end of 1968, Aretha files for divorce. The relationship was so bad that she actually had to file a restraining order against him. Her brother, Cecil, becomes Aretha's new manager. Artists often choose to get their family involved because they trust them. And in Aretha's case, she had enormous trust issues by this time. The next few years are a whirlwind of touring and recording. She's earning between forty dollars and $50,000 a show, which is an enormous amount of money at that time. By 1970, Aretha begins a new relationship with Ken Cunningham, who becomes a road manager. In March 1970, she gives birth to her fourth son, Kalf. And a few months later, she's back on stage in Detroit, performing to an audience of 6,000 people. But the pressure of the last few years are too much to bear. 
things kind of came to a head. She was being pulled in a lot of different directions. A lot of people coming at her. A lot of fear and anxiety that people are using her or manipulating her. She's on stage in Detroit. She does one song and she just breaks down. Aretha suffers a nervous collapse. She goes to a hospital in remote Connecticut for treatment so the press won't find out. When legendary soul singer Aretha Franklin dies in 2018, she appears not to have left behind a final will and testament. Aretha's estate is valued somewhere between 17 and as much as $80 million, reflecting the continued royalties from all her hits. What does Michigan law say? It says all of your kids share equally. And that was fine. All four children were going to split the Aretha Franklin estate equally, and everything would have been done and good Aretha's sons, Clarence, Edward, Ted, and Kalf, each receive $350,000 from the estate up front and agree to appoint their cousin Sabrina Owens as the estate executor. But months later, as she cleans out Aretha's main residence, Owens discovers three handwritten wills. These are handwritten documents. One is four pages. Another one is 11 pages. There are crossouts. they're crumpled. One was found in the cushions of her couch. This sounds a little bit kind of crazy, right? But the truth is, you can have a handwritten will. You don't have to have a lawyer write up your will. A handwritten will is an enforceable, valid, legal document. The problem here is that we have three of them. The wills contradict each other as to who would ultimately be in charge of Aretha Franklin's estate. The estate battle in Aretha's case is really going to be about who's going to own her intellectual property and the right to her image and likeness. From the start of her career in the 1960s, Aretha Franklin had her own way of taking care of business. She lost certain people that she trusted over the years to help her with her finances. She took it upon herself to try to keep her money close. Aretha's method of keeping her money close would also become part of her stage performances. She would demand cash up front, usually $25 thousand dollars and she would stuff it in a purse and the funny thing about that was that that became her signature she would come out with her purse and when the gig was over she would pick up her purse and she would get off stage and the audience knew that it was over thank you for sharing this very special with me thank you the cash was used to pay her staff off the book. Aretha made no records and deducted no taxes, but her methods weren't unusual in the music industry. For most musicians in that day, you got ripped off by the record companies. You got ripped off on royalties, contracts were skewed. You were really on your own to use your own star power to make money in any way you can. In 1970, Aretha Franklin is regularly playing to audiences of over 6,000 people and commanding up to $50,000 a show. But soon after the birth of her fourth son, the pressure becomes unbearable and she suffers a nervous breakdown. After recuperating, Aretha does something unheard of for her next album, Amazing Grace. In 1972, Aretha takes everybody to church. Aretha decides to do something different. She decides to go back to her roots and wants to do a gospel performance. Aretha's plan to pair secular and spiritual music and perform live in church is an industry first, but there is a backlash. I know that a lot of church folks didn't like the fact that she had some secular songs on that album, but it is a precursor to what kind of music is now acceptable today. Amazing Grace was performed in Los Angeles in front of a church congregation. Even Mick Jagger showed up for it. A lot of people will say she takes you to church, but you feel Jesus. You feel the spirit moving through you when she opens her mouth and sings Amazing Grace. The album sells more than two million copies. Amazing Grace is still one of the best-selling gospel albums of all time. But by 1975, Aretha's album sales are slumping, and she declares that she wants to pursue a second career in films, not unlike a rival diva, Diana Ross. I have no limits, no boundaries on myself. I would love very much to do a movie or a telefilm, but I have no limits. She moves to Southern California with her boyfriend, Ken Cunningham, and her kids. But by 1976, she and Ken break up, and shortly after, she starts dating actor Glenn Turman. 
Aretha had many long-term relationships with many men, and she was always looking to kind of be the princess. She wanted the knight to save her. In 1978, after a whirlwind romance, Aretha and Glyn Turman get married in an elaborate fairy tale ceremony that almost doesn't happen because Turman doesn't sign the prenuptial agreement until an hour before Aretha walks down the aisle. Her wedding that she planned to Glenn was a fairy tale. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars. She wore a white, beautiful gown with mink on it. There were doves and flowers, and it really was exactly what any little girl would imagine a wedding would be. Aretha and Glenn joined families, Aretha with her four boys and Glenn with his kids. By 1979, Aretha's acting aspirations aren't going anywhere and her recording career is also struggling. Aretha's career is definitely in a rough patch. Her last three records with Atlantic have bombed, and she is about to walk out of the label. By the mid-'70s, music is beginning to change away from Aretha Franklin. It's less about soul, and it's more about the dance floor and disco. And this is not exactly in the pocket for Aretha. Nevertheless, she's still in tremendous demand around the world, especially on stage. On June 10th, 1979, moments after ending her show at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas, Aretha gets shocking news. She finds out that there's a home invasion in her father's home, in her childhood home in Detroit, and that he's shot and now in a coma. This was devastating to the Queen of Soul. The senseless act of violence would alter the trajectory of Aretha's life and ultimately her future and fortune. It changed the whole makeup and fabric of not just her as a person, but her career. A year after the Queen of Soul's death, the battle for control over Aretha Franklin's estate is threatening to tear her family apart. It was thought by many people that Aretha Franklin didn't even have a will. And then all of a sudden, not only did they find one will, but they found three wills. Along with the discovery of the wills, Aretha's family also finds other oddities. There were like $900,000 in uncashed checks that they found, along with those wills. If the court validates the 2010 wills, they would assign Calf, Ted Jr., and Sabrina Owens as joint executors. If the 2014 will wins in court, Calf would be the sole executor. But all the wills leave the eldest brother, Clarence, in the cold. We all come to find out that her eldest, Clarence, was a son who had special needs. There were a lot of questions as to how Clarence was going to be taken care of, who was going to be taking care of him. And ultimately, to the public, this is a really sad situation. Edward Franklin largely sides with Kelf. Ted White Jr. asks the judge to consider all three wills as representing Franklin's full wishes and asks to be named executor alongside Aretha's niece, Sabrina Owens. Aretha Franklin's estate is valued somewhere between 17 and $80 million. So naturally, people are going to be fighting over this money. 40 years earlier, Aretha's career and finances are going through a rough patch. Her last three albums for Atlanta Records have bombed, and then tragedy strikes when her father, C.L. Franklin, is shot during a home invasion in Detroit. He's injured terribly, falls into a coma, and he's never the same. It's not just that he's never the same, it's that his care is entrusted, both financially and personally, to Aretha. Aretha is paying for 85% of CL's round-the-clock care. And it's costing her almost $2,500 a week. Now that's putting pressure on her to find more ways to make money. After 12 years at Atlantic, Aretha leaves and signs with Clive Davis and Arista Records. In 1982, her new album, Jump To It, is released and shoots to the top of the R&B charts, her first number one hit in five years. Aretha was back on the top of the charts. She was appearing in film. She'd appeared in the Blues Brothers, which was one of the coolest things that ever happened in 1980. And it changed people's perception of her a little bit. But when it comes to touring to support her albums, Aretha's fears and phobias are costing her. The robbery had this residual effect on Aretha. She was full of anxiety and fear. She didn't want anything to happen to her. She didn't want anything else to happen to her family. So even though she doesn't want to be out touring, she has to. It's the only way she's going to earn money. After one show in Atlanta, she happened to fly back to Detroit, and it was a terrible, terrible flight. Aretha Franklin develops an intense fear of flying. This is very bad for a singer who makes her money off of touring, because now she's refusing to tour. She's refusing to fly anywhere. In July 1984, Aretha's father dies. She finalizes her divorce from Glyn Turman and moves back to Detroit permanently to be with her family. 
In 1985, Aretha releases Who's Zoomin' Who? The album produces her biggest hit since Respect. Freeway of Love leaps to number one on the Black Dance Club charts. It was also her first real video hit. It crossed over, became a pop hit, and her first number one dance hit, earning her another Grammy. The 80s were an amazing time for Aretha, almost as big a time as the late 60s. Aretha's personal style is also evolving. And then there's her faithful love of Chinchilla, Mink, and Sable. She loved to be the center of attention. She loved to wear her fur coats, to drop them down on the stage in the middle of performance, to wear the glitzy costumes. It's estimated Aretha owned as much as $1 million in fur coats. Aretha Franklin was the type of diva who would wear a fur coat that looked great on the hottest day of the year in a cramped tour bus because she wanted to look like the diva. In the early 1990s, Aretha runs into money troubles. In 1990, Aretha Franklin is sued for $230,000 for backing out of a Broadway musical about Mahalia Jackson. And it's around that time where the tax man comes a calling. The IRS puts a $225,000 tax lien on her home. But despite her money woes, Aretha refuses to turn her business management over to a professional. Over the years, she will be sued by local Detroit businesses, including plumbers, florists, and caterers for invoices not paid. She was not a great businesswoman, certainly. Throughout the 1990s and 2000s, Aretha can't match the record sales that she had in previous decades. In the early 90s, Aretha Franklin is making two to five million dollars a year, still very much part of the culture, but she's not part of the Billboard Hot 100. But there's no denying that the Queen of Soul can still bring a house down as evident at the 1998 Grammy Awards. She was supposed to appear to celebrate the anniversary of the Blues Brothers film that she had been in in 1980, when Luciano Pavarotti called in and said that he would not be able to do his performance. He was too ill to do it. In stepped Aretha Franklin to sing an unbelievable version of Nessun Dorma, which proved to people that she not only had a great voice for R&B, gospel, and soul, but had a voice that was literally operatic. It was an incredible performance. 10 years later, Aretha would wow again. Aretha Franklin had a stunning performance for President Obama's inauguration. It was one of the highlights. Two million people watch, and her gray wool bow tie hat, studded with Swarovski crystals, becomes immediately iconic. Aretha pays $179 for the hat, created by a Detroit-based milliner who gets hundreds of customer requests for the same style. When Aretha Franklin got up at President Obama's inauguration to sing My Country Tis of Thee, it was almost like history was coming full circle. She had come from the civil rights movement. She had marched and performed with Dr. Martin Luther King. And to have her sing for Barack Obama, the first African-American president elected in the United States, was almost like a homecoming. A year later, in 2010, Aretha Franklin is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Cancer had taken both her sisters and her brother, Cecil. And even though her health is in jeopardy, Aretha is not yet ready to give in when it comes to controlling her career and her image. It would be evident when a long-lost film about the recording of her groundbreaking gospel album, Amazing Grace, is resurrected. The story of Amazing Grace the film, the footage, the documentary, is so complicated and has so many twists and turns, it could be a movie unto itself. Although the documentary would eventually go on to make millions, Aretha would fight in court right up until her death to keep it out of the public eye. When the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, dies in 2018 after suffering with pancreatic cancer for over eight years, she leaves behind a large fortune between $17 million and $80 million, but no apparent final will and testament. It definitely says that there was a tremendous amount of disorganization in Aretha's life at that time, which is really surprising. Because she had been ill for such a long time, she had plenty of time to get her affairs in order. But months later, the discovery of three handwritten wills ignites an estate war. You can't have three valid, enforceable wills, especially when the terms conflict, as they do here. It's bad news for everybody, except for the lawyers involved. $600,000 has already been cashed in in legal fees for this fiasco. 
Many questions will be raised as to why Aretha Franklin didn't consult a lawyer to draw up her estate plan. Many people believe this is because Aretha Franklin didn't trust her lawyers. But back in 2015, Aretha Franklin does use a lawyer's services when she blocks a public screening of the documentary about the recording of her 1972 gospel album, Amazing Grace. Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace is still one of the preeminent gospel albums of all time. It is her best-selling album. The album was recorded live with a full band and choir at an LA church over two nights in January 1972 in front of a large congregation that included Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, and Charlie Watts. But few people are aware that at the same time, the entire concert experience was recorded with five different cameras. A young director by the name of Sidney Pollack, who we all know ultimately becomes quite well known, is in charge of this shoot. Somehow or another, that film had never seen the light of day. In fact, people had even forgotten it existed. But in 2007, a young film producer named Adam Elliott resurrects the footage and contacts Aretha Franklin, who agrees to come on board. But things soon unravel. He wants to turn it into a new documentary using all the archival footage and unseen footage with new interviews and uh, footage with Aretha Franklin. It would also include a new performance with Aretha and the surviving band and choir members from the 1972 concert. She demands a million dollars for a one day of filming. She actually reneges on this. He does not drop it. He continues trying to figure out a way that he can make Amazing Grace, the performance, into a movie. Forging ahead without Aretha Franklin and her estate's permission, Alan Elliott finishes editing the documentary. And by 2015, he is invited to screen Amazing Grace at the Telluride Film Festival. When Aretha gets wind of this, she's furious. But this time, now Aretha is suffering from pancreatic cancer. She has no patience for this guy or for this idea, and she ends up suing him. The argument that Alan Elliott and his team made was that the film version that he made wasn't exactly the same performance that she did on Amazing Grace live in front of the church or on the record. It wasn't a winning argument, apparently, at the time, and he wasn't allowed to air the film ever again until after Aretha's death. The Queen of Soul dies three years later. Her funeral is a royal affair in her hometown of Detroit. Hundreds of fans pay their respects over three days of public viewings prior to the official funeral. Aretha Franklin's funeral was an extravagant affair, just as it should have been, befitting the Queen of Soul. It was a celebration of her life. There was live music, there were flowers, there were flamboyant speakers, there were people speaking of love for the Queen of Soul. The first 1,000 people who were lined up outside Greater Grace Temple on the morning of the funeral were able to attend the memorial services along with the many public figures and celebrities. The church had a capacity for 4,000 people. Ariana Grande singing, Bill Clinton in attendance. There was over $200,000 in costs for this eight-hour funeral. Over $50,000 for flowers. Aretha Franklin was buried in a fur coat with a golden microphone in her hand. Aretha's sons and extended family are unified in their grief, but the discovery of the wills has the opposite effect. Ultimately, it causes a big mess within her camp. Aretha's youngest son, Calf Cunningham, is especially vocal in the various court proceedings. Her niece, Sabrina Owens, was left with the job of executing the will. And it's a mess that she's trying to untangle and fix for the sake of the family. Kalf accuses his cousin Sabrina Owens and the lawyers of mismanaging Aretha's assets. The lawyers defend Owens, citing the $1.1 million she's brought into the estate. Now we have to remember Aretha owed a lot of money and back taxes, and then we had to pay those taxes some way. After over 45 years in the making, the Amazing Grace documentary is released in 2018 to rave reviews. Sabrina Owens actually worked with Elliot to get this documentary approved. Now this was after Aretha died, and Sabrina had the legal right to work with Elliot to get this film approved. It was released to incredible response. To date, it has made over $5.7 million. Amazing Grace helps to reduce the estate's multi-million dollar debt to the IRS, but that does little to appease Kalf, and the tensions of the estate battle continue, with the judge urging the family into mediation to avoid more costly litigation. 
the family could go in and resolve this conflict themselves. But of course, when we have big money, that doesn't happen, and the family is fighting. When Aretha Franklin dies in 2018, her estate is estimated between 17 and $80 million. The public is surprised to learn that the Queen of Soul did not leave a final will and testament. And initially, everything was supposed to be split four ways between her four sons, Ted, Clarence, Edward, and Kel. But eight months later, events would take a turn and spark an estate war pitting brother against brother. When they started clearing out her property, they actually started to find these handwritten wills tucked away in very odd places. Each of them said something different, some of them in complete contradiction. This meant an incredible difficulty to untangle in terms of legality. Two wills are dated 2010, and one is dated 2014. This sounds a little bit unbelievable that someone like Aretha Franklin would handwrite a will in the first place and then stick it between the cushions of her couch. The documents are confusing and difficult to read, but the biggest sticking point to emerge is confusion over which of Aretha Franklin's family members would be in charge of her vast music catalog and ongoing royalties. There's not only a significant estate of many millions of dollars, but there's future royalty income of a significant amount for the future. All that leads to a battle over who controls what rights. In the 2014 will, Aretha appears to assign her sons, Ted White Jr. and Kelf Cunningham, and her niece Sabrina Owens as joint executors. But then the names of Ted and Sabrina are crossed out and a space is left blank for a new name. There's some confusion over which will and which will is gonna control and who's gonna get what. Another major source of tension are the provisions for Aretha's firstborn son, Clarence, who was born when she was a young teenager. It turns out that Clarence has special needs. Clarence currently resides in a group home outside Detroit. In the 2014 document, he doesn't appear to be named as a beneficiary and must rely on his brothers for his financial needs. In a hearing, Clarence's lawyer has argued that none of the three wills can be authenticated. The problem with these wills is that they conflict. So it was almost as if it were better off if no wills were found, because there was no conflict there. That way, all four children share equally. The problem with these wills is that there's nieces named in there, cousins named in there. How should Clarence, her oldest child who has special needs, be taken care of? Who is in charge of what? There's so much conflict, the court doesn't know what to do. Calf Cunningham and Edward Franklin favor the 2014 document that assigns Cunningham as sole executor while Ted White Jr. wants the court to consider all the wills as representing his mother's full wishes. He also requests to be named a state executor alongside their cousin, Sabrina Owens. It's gonna come down to who has power over future decisions that are made. Someone's gonna be in charge, and whoever's gonna be in charge is gonna be able to, to dictate how those assets are licensed out and used by others in the future. In one 2019 court hearing, Clarence has voiced his objections to his brother Calf through his lawyer. Calf, who favors the 2014 will, has been the most aggressive in court filings since the discovery of the wills. In 2019, he criticized the estate executors for taking too long to catalog some of Aretha's assets. He's also critical of how the lawyers managing the estate and his cousin Sabrina Owens are handling projects that Aretha herself approved prior to her death. In early January 2020, Calf takes to social media to call fans to boycott the upcoming MGM biopic, Respect, about his mother starring Oscar winner Jennifer Hudson. David Bennett, Aretha Franklin's longtime attorney and lead counsel for the estate, makes a rebuttal in the media. Aretha Franklin was very much a family woman. She loved her children, she loved her parents, and I think she would be devastated about the feuding and infighting that has succumbed in her passing. 
By late January 2020, Sabrina Owens announces her resignation as executor to calm the rift in the family. In a statement delivered in court, Owens says, given my aunt's love of family and desire for privacy, this is not what she would have wanted for us, nor is it what I want. I hope that my departure will allow the business of the estate to continue, calm the rift in my family, and allow me to return to my personal life. I love my cousins, hold no animosity towards them, and wish them the best. In March 2020, a judge appoints prominent Detroit attorney Reginald Turner as a temporary personal representative for the estate, but a court date to find out which wills are deemed legitimate is still pending. What has to happen here? The court needs to resolve the conflict. The three different wills have different levels of complexity. One's a very simple will, and the other two are a little more complex. So the question remains is, what what will is going to be held valid by the court? The question becomes which of Aretha Franklin's sons will ultimately be in charge of Aretha Incorporated if none of the wills are accepted. The judge might even make the determination that none of them are valid. And then you look at the laws of intestate succession by that particular state, and the state decides how the assets are divided. Given the fact that future earnings from publishing rights, upcoming film and TV projects, and continued royalties is projected into the millions, this is the all-important question for the future of Aretha Franklin's legacy. It's really a shame that the kids are fighting over this money. If the family could come together and agree to something and present it to the court, there is no doubt the pain would be less I hope for Aretha Franklin's heirs, they remember what an incredible talent she was and the way that she's perceived by the public, and nothing is done to tarnish that legacy. You wouldn't have Beyonce without Aretha. You wouldn't have Whitney without Aretha. You wouldn't have Rihanna without Aretha. She set the stage for so many other women of color to rise, and you have to respect that. Aretha Franklin is the soundtrack to my life. From the time that I can remember, I grew up in a household that was steeped in gospel music, and of course, Amazing Grace was a huge part of the songs that resonated in my household, but also Respect, and also her Columbia recordings. Those are songs that still stick with me. 